Tony from Bridgeport Christian Church. If you're joining us for the first time, we welcome you and hope you will join us again and we send an invitation to you to join us in person when we are able to once again gather in our sanctuary for worship, music, and fellowship. In this changing time, we have all had to adapt to doing things that we haven't done before. We've all tried to stay healthy and safe and still continue to be a part of the worship service that this new technology affords us. Reverend Shepherd will be bringing her message today. The theme is the golden calf. We hope you will continue to watch and be a part of the service, praising God for all the good things that he continues to do for us all. We hope this service is meaningful to you and your family. Good morning. I'm Ted Sloan and I'm Vice Chair of the Administrative Board at Bridgeport Christian Church. Reverend Ann Shepherd preached her first sermon for Bridgeport Christian Church on this spot in late January. And we all knew that things were going to be a little bit different. But we had no idea. Over the past seven months, Ann has made it her mission to make sure that you have a worship service from Bridgeport Christian Church every Sunday morning. At the same time, she's worked with our committees to keep them going and thinking ahead, and she's worked with church leaders and volunteers like our audiovisual team to enhance our online presence, but also to reach out to the unserved and the underserved in our community. I believe, and I've heard many other people say, that Pastor Ann was exactly the right person at exactly the right time for Bridgeport Christian Church. And so on this Pastor Appreciation Sunday and on behalf of the Administrative Board and Board Chair Nancy Bailey, I am pleased to present this very small token of our appreciation to the Reverend Ann Shepherd for everything that she has done for Bridgeport Christian Church this year.
At this time, I would ask you to bow your head and join me in beginning the worship service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for the outpouring of love and support that you have given to me and my family over the past seven months, or however long it's been, ten months. Um, thank you for all of the warm birthday wishes. Thank you for the token of appreciation on this Pastor's Appreciation Day. And I also want to draw your attention to... Uh, two more things that are happening um, over the next couple of days. Today is National Coming Out Day. So for all of our siblings that are LGBTQIA, we see you, we affirm you, and we love you as God loves you. And tomorrow we do celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. And so today I once again acknowledge the sins that we have committed and the pain that we have placed on so many who lived on this land and served in worship faithfully from the very beginning. Today we're going to begin something a little new in worship and we're going to continue it as we move forward. Each week while we are worshiping online, we will be adding the children A Children in Worship and Wonder Story for the day. Since worship is for the whole community of God, it is important that we do what we can to honor all of the people in our community, beginning with the very young. Each story that we will hear will relate to the sermon topic for the day. Today we will hear the story, The Ten Best Ways to Live, told to us by the Reverend Diana hodges Baska. Diana is the associate pastor at Florence Christian Church in Florence, Kentucky, and a children worship and wonder storyteller trainer. She's also a good friend of mine. Diana spent Friday and Saturday with myself, Lori, Anita, and Karen as we work together to enhance worship for the whole people of God at every age. I invite us all to gather together as we play a video of one of God's sacred stories. Let us get ready to hear one of God's sacred stories, special stories by singing, Be Still and Know. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. 
This is the desert box. So many things, important things, happen in the desert that we just have to have a small piece of it in our room. The desert is a strange and wild place. At night, it's very cold, but in the day, it's burning hot. There's almost no water at all. The desert is always changing. The wind comes and it blows and it shapes and it molds. So the desert is never the same. After God had led the people of God through the water to freedom, they were free to go any way they wanted. But what was the best way to go? Hmm. Well, God loved the people so much that God said to Moses, I will show you the way. I will lead you to the holy mountain, Mount Sinai. Now, when they came to the Mount Holy Mountain, they could see fire and smoke, and they were afraid even to come close. But Moses went close. Moses climbed the holy mountain and stayed there talking with God. And God told Moses the 10 best ways to live. When Moses came down from the holy mountain, he gave the 10 best ways to live to the people. There were four best ways for loving God. And there were six best ways for loving people. The 10 best ways are so important. We call them the law. And we add this other piece so that we can remember why God gave us the law, the 10 best ways to live. It says, God loves you. Would you like to know what the 10 best ways to live are that God told Moses? I can show you. The first are the best ways for loving God. At the very beginning, God said, I am the one we true. Share together in a bidding prayer. A bidding prayer allows for you to add in your specific petitions and prayers. I will start each petition and invite you to offer your prayers in each section. <clears throat> you may pray with those around you or offer your petitions and prayers in the chat on Facebook. 
Let us pray together for the church and the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Let us pray for those around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us to rely on your strength and to accept our responsibilities to our fellow citizens, that we may elect trustworthy leaders and make wise decisions for the well-being of society, that we may serve you faithfully in our generation and honor your holy name. Let us pray for our leaders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Let us pray for your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as Christ loves us. Let us pray for our neighbors and our families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Let us pray for the sick. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. We pray for those who mourn and those we have lost. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O Lord, our God, accept our fervent prayers to you. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. 
for you are gracious, and to you we give glory now and forever. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Our focus scripture for this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. Let us hear now a sacred story of God's covenant people. The people saw that Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain. They gathered around Aaron and said to him, come on. Make us, God who, make us gods who can lead us. As for this man, Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't have a clue what happened to him. Aaron said to them, All right, take out the gold rings from your, the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took out the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He collected them and tied them up in a cloth. He made a metal image of a bull calf, and the people declared, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf. Then Aaron announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. They got up early the next day and offered up entirely burned offerings and brought well-being sacrifices. The people sat down to eat and drink and then got up to celebrate. The Lord spoke to Moses, Hurry up and go down. Your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, are ruining everything. They've already abandoned the path that I commanded. They have made a metal bull calf for themselves. They've bowed down to it and offered sacrifices to it and declared, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I've been watching these people, and I've seen how stubborn they are. Now leave me alone. Let my fury burn and devour them. Then I'll make a great nation out of you. But Moses pleaded with the Lord his God, Lord, why does your fury burn against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and amazing force. Why should the Egyptians say, God had an evil plan to take the people out and kill them in the mountains and so wipe them off the earth? Calm down your fierce anger. Change your mind about doing terrible things to your own people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, whom you yourself promised, I'll make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And I've promised to give your descendants this whole land to possess for all time. Then the Lord changed their mind about the terrible things they said they would do to their people. This is a story of God's covenant people. Thanks be to God. 
Well, this is a story we've all heard before, isn't it? You know the one. Parents go out of town for a few days, leaving their teenagers home alone for the first time in forever. The teenagers think they're grown, so they invite over a few friends for pizza and a movie. Next thing you know, the friends have invited friends who have invited friends with a keg, and everyone starts to worship mom's gold face. Then the parents come home early to a messy house, drunk teenagers, and a broken, irreplaceable vase. So they decide that the only thing they can do is to take out everyone at the party and start over with a new set of kids. Classic story. We see it all the time. Well, in a lot of ways, that is our story for today. The story of the golden calf is one of those Bible stories that we assume we know inside and out. And we look at it almost like one of Aesop's fables. We see it as a story that we are told to teach us a simple lesson about who God is and what we should do. We probably heard it for the first time at around hmm, three years old, maybe, in Sunday school. And it struck fear in us, and we never looked at it again. Today, I want to invite us to go past that simple answer and look more closely at this sacred story of God and God's covenant people and see if it can teach us something a little deeper. Now first, let me give you a timeline for action. The Israelites are out of Egypt. They have made it through the Reed Sea into the desert. They are scared and don't know this God who has delivered them. They are blindly trusting their leaders and this unseen force that seems to be behind them. What they know is that Moses goes a lot and talks to God and then relays God's messages to them. The story of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Best Ways to Live, is told to us in Exodus 20. But there's something here that I had never noticed until recently. When Moses receives the Ten Commandments, they aren't yet written on the stones, despite what the movies have shown us. Instead, the people see thunder and lightning while Moses is talking to God and are afraid. So after Moses receives the Ten Commandments, he doesn't come down and tell them what God had said. Instead, as verses 18 through 21 of chapter 20 tell us, when all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the horn and the mountain smoking, the people shook with fear and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but don't let God speak to us or we'll die. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid because God has come only to test you and to make sure you are always in awe of God so that you don't sin. The people then stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness in which God was present. So Moses goes back up the mountain, and God gives him even more laws in chapters 21 through 23. Then Moses, per God's orders, builds an altar, calls it the Ark of the Covenant, and places the covenant, which is the Ten Commandments, all the laws of God, in it and begins making sacrifices 
per God's commands. Then Moses takes Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 others up that same mountain to go hang out with God and eat and drink together. Eventually then, when Aaron and the others come back down the mountain, Moses stays up there with God, receiving even more instructions and even more law and very detailed descriptions of the tabernacle, the rituals that they need to follow, the offerings that should be performed, and so much more. Moses stays up on that mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, which is a long time for a leader to be away from a group of people that have been taken away from a life that they understand into a life that they don't understand. By the time we get to chapter 32, the Israelites are scared and tired. They don't know what to do or how to proceed. So they reach out to Aaron for help. Aaron is Moses' brother and a leader. Surely he will know what to do. So Aaron, in an attempt to both comfort and appease the people that he has been called to serve, tells everyone to go gather their gold earrings and rings, everything that's left after coating the Ark of the Covenant in gold, and bring them to him. Not knowing what else to do, he does the only thing that he can think of. He fashions a bull calf, not a new god to be worshipped, but as a representation of the God of Israel and probably some other gods as well, and declares that the next day will be a festival day to the God of Israel. The golden calf was not worshipped as a god, but rather as a dwelling place for the gods, a divine seat. As commentator Robert Alter tells us, having precisely the same function as the cherubim over the ark, and thus creating an anti-tabernacle. Robert Alter even points out that the golden calves and bulls were used by the northern kingdom of Israel in their temples at both Dan and Bethel, competing with the tabernacle in Jerusalem. These were designed not as polytheistic or paganistic thrones, but as thrones for the God of Israel. That's a different perspective, isn't it? How is what Aaron has done different from what Moses did when he instructed everyone to build the Ark of the Covenant? Why is Aaron punished for building a bull calf as a seat for God in chapter 32 when Moses is exalted building the Ark of Gold in chapter 25? Well, the simple answer is that it comes down to the motivation with which each person acted, not the actual act of building the altar. When Moses leads the Israelite people in building the Ark of the Covenant, he is doing so in full communion and discernment with God. When Aaron leads the Israelite people in building a bull calf, he is acting out of fear and impatience over the perceived absence of God. Instead of waiting for God, Aaron takes matters into his own hands and, while fulfilling the needs of the people around him immediately, sets them up for hardship in the long term. Now, that is a story that may hit a little close to home, especially today. 
David Bender, in his commentary on the passage, says, It is too easy for folks to assume their own experience and to rush ahead toward accomplishments without waiting for God's guidance. It's too easy for congregations and governments to act quickly upon a promising idea without asking the hard questions about God's will for the project. It's too easy for people to make the most important life decisions, marriage, calling, career, family, without bringing God into the conversation. It's sometimes too easy to be just like Aaron. Mm. Yep, that one stung a little. How have we been like Aaron? When have we been so quick to run into a decision that we haven't waited to see where God is leading us? I admit, I am not the most patient person in the world all the time. In fact, I have spent a good portion of my life learning how to be patient and how to sit in the calm and the stillness to hear that still, small voice of God leading me. I used to joke that God had to smack me upside my head with a two-by-four to get what God was saying to me. But God doesn't always work that way. We don't often get burning bushes and thunder and lightning. And sometimes, God seems to be silent. And it is in those moments that we have to ask ourselves, is God really being silent? Or am I being fearful and impatient? And I think this is a question that we have to ask ourselves, not only in our personal journeys, but in our leadership as well. Are we doing what we are doing because it's the right thing to do? Or are we doing what we are doing because it will appease the crowd? When do we need to make compromises? When do we need to stand firm? These are hard questions to answer in our own lives and in our positions of leadership, especially when fear of the unknown is involved. And this has struck particularly close to home as we stand in the midst of a global pandemic and think toward what I have heard some refer to as the after times. This weekend, I felt the spirit of God moving among us as I sat and thought through worship for all and what that may begin to look like in the aftertimes with others at a children worship and wonder training. We talked about a lot of things, very much like what Aaron was dealing with as he sat at the bottom of Mount Sinai with the Israelites. Fear, wanting things to return to the way they were before, not understanding the future, wanting to honor God, but also wanting to be comfortable. And we asked hard questions, including how can we worship together as the people of God in community from the youngest to the oldest and meet people developmentally and spiritually where they are. And what I see in this space and time we have two choices. Listen for the leading of God or rush into our own understanding of what we want. 
And I believe that as we look to worship in the after times, we are all, not just the four of us who talked this weekend, but all of us from the elders to the board to those who are not currently serving in leadership roles, are discerning what God is leading us to in this time and space that we have never seen before. The conversation continues, and God is in the midst of it. We just have to remember to be patient and to be open to the movement of the Spirit. I am grateful that we have had the chance to examine the sacred story of God more closely today. It is my prayer that as we continue to sit with it in all of its uncomfortableness, we can see how we can learn even more and grow even deeper as we seek to serve God and care for God's people around us. Amen. Patience is a virtue. Well, I admit I don't have a lot of patience. Just saying. I think we all have, at one time or another, been caught up in the I want it now mentality. We don't have a lot of patience when it comes to having to wait on something. When Aaron and the others lost patience waiting for Moses to come down from that mountain, what did they do? Instead of waiting to see what God had planned for them, they grew impatient. God provides in God's time. We know the blessings he gives, the grace he gives, and we just need to be patient and wait. Giving whatever it is, be it money, time, talent, or sometimes easier than waiting. So today, be thinking about how you can continue to give by whatever means that you can to support the church and the workings of Bridgeport Christian Church.
Would you bow now your head and pray with me? Dear Lord, even though we are not physically in your house, we are there in spirit and love and friendship. Accept these gifts, whatever form they may take. Use them for the betterment of your world, for your world needs your grace, your love, and your blessings. To God be the glory. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Technology can be a blessing or a curse, can't it? We've probably all had the experience of trusting our GPS system to get us to our destination, only to have it lead us down a dead-end street. That's what Moses' GPS did in the wilderness. Instead of depositing the Israelites safely away from the Egyptian army, Moses and the followers are led right up to the Reed Sea. Dead end. But we follow a God who makes a way out of no way. Just when you think there's nowhere else to turn, when all roads are blocked and all exits are closed, when your only choice is to go back to where you don't want to go or to go forward to where you don't want to be, God makes a way. The communion table is the way. It is the parting of the Reed Sea for our souls, a path away from our past through the present and into the new future. Christ's sacrifice for us means that we are never at a dead end because God's love for us will always make a way. As we take this bread and this cup, let us ask God to show us the next step on our journey of faith. And may we take it with boldness and confidence, trusting that Christ walks with us. As we share in this communion together, let us remember that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me, please. Our dear, gracious Father, we praise you and glorify you as our one and only God. More than anything, we ask that you bind our wandering hearts to you in joyful worship, knowing that for this reason we were created. Thank you that our lives are not defined by our mistakes. Every day we can turn to you for loving guidance and mercy. As we take this bread and cup, let us feel the power of your spirit to inspire us to live through faith in you. We say this prayer in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen.
thank you so much for joining us in our online worship experience today. We hope you will continue to worship with us. Uh, we will start uh, uploading our worship services to YouTube very soon. Um, also, once again, I'm very Lord's question to you. May the Lord make the divine face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace now and